So there are two types of objects inside ZBrush, primitive objects and polymesh 3D objects. Primitive objects are just that, primitive, um, you can't do an awful lot with them, and polymesh 3D objects are sculptable objects. When you first start off with a primitive object, we can have a look down here and we can see the initialize roll up in the tool palette for that object allows us to do certain things like change how many divisions this has on both horizontal and vertical scale. We can twist it, we can change its size, etc. As I change these divisions, you can see the polygon count here does actually change because it's actually changing the geometry. However, I can't sculpt on this geometry. I can't unwrap this geometry. I can't modify this in any other way other than with these parameters which are located down here. Once I have done that, however, I can then generate a sculptable mesh. I'm just going to go to a new, new cube. If I had created a new primitive from scratch, if I hit the Make Polymesh 3D button, that will actually convert this into a Polymesh 3D. Another way to do this is with the initialized parameter still available to me, this is still a primitive object, by simply hitting Duplicate, I will get a duplicate of this, but that duplicate will be, as you can see here, a Polymesh 3D object. So the initialized parameters for this do not contain those parameters for a primitive. They allow us to just change this into a different piece of geometry altogether. So in this way, we actually we can have a primitive object with these parameters and a non-primitive object or a polymesh 3D with these parameters. This object is sculptable. So just going back to our original set, we have diff three different kinds of sculptable objects. Uh, I'm going to turn this off for a second and we'll concentrate on the first. This is a duplicate of this primitive object. And for this, we're going to use dynamic subdivision. There are two types of subdivision, dynamic and real. Dynamic subdivision allows you to, ha to mimic what would happen with real subdivision, but without actually committing to it. So each of these has two different aspects to it. When you use subdivision, you're effectively quadrupling the polygon count for your object, and you're also attempting to smooth the object. That's the default action. To do this, if we go down to the geometry rollup, you can see that we have dynamic subdivision here. And if I turn this on, by default, it will try and smooth this twice. But that, I'll just reduce that to one to see what the difference is. So from zero, if I turn it effectively off, no smoothing, smooth it once. It's mimicking, quadrupling the polygon count and smoothing it at the same time. But you'll notice that the polygon count up here doesn't actually change as I do this. So whether I have this off or on makes no difference. And the reason for that is that this is just a preview of what this would look like were you to use real subdivision levels three or four or the amount that you specify here. The difference between this and the other subdivision will become clear soon, but just to show very initially, if we turn this off just for a second and we make a change to this mesh, for example, this was located off the center of the world. So I'm going to make sure local symmetry is turned on in order to use symmetry. I can go to modify topology with this object and I can mirror and weld and that will actually change the topology of this mesh. And I can do that because this doesn't have real subdivision levels. If it did, this wouldn't be possible. So this object can be unwrapped. I can go to the unwrap tab. I can unwrap that and um, I can slice this using a slice curve. We can change here to a slice curve. We can slice that object. We can use panel loops. We can use group loops. We can use insert multi-mesh brushes uh, such as this. I can insert new objects onto that. I can draw curves on this. I can use a curve tube brush, for example, if I wanted to. So all these things can be done with a mesh that's just got a uh, dynamic subdivision turned on. And I can, I can do these things while the dynamic subdivision is enabled. Uh, I'm just pressing D to turn this on or off, D and Shift D. Um, so I'm going to undo that. Um, so the polygon count, as we said for this, doesn't actually change regardless of whether we're actually simulating or the amount of levels of simulation that we're doing um, for that. We can also even modify the geometry by holding down control and clicking while we're in the transform mode for move, scale, or rotate. And that way we can actually duplicate the, the geometry. You can see here, we now have double the amount of polygons on this. Um, and if I control drag, we'll get rid of the mask and we still have two objects here. So you can duplicate this object as often as you like by just holding down control and dragging out copies of it. I'm going to undo that for the moment. 
thing that you can't do with this is you can't generate normal maps. So normally you will go down to your normal map here after first going into your geometry, sorry, and setting your subdivision level. But because we don't actually have a real subdivision level, if I go down to normal map here or displacement map and I say create a normal map, it won't allow me to do that because I'm always at the highest subdivision level. There is no fake subdivision level. If I turn this off and try the same thing, I'm going to get the same or another error. So effectively, what this is good for is making objects at a very basic level. It's great for hard surface stuff. Um, it's great for blocking stuff out. It's great for maintaining the original shape for as long as you possibly can. I'm going to undo some of my changes here um, and show you that when I turn on subdivision and I turn it off again, the original shape is not modified. Moving on to real subdivision levels. Real subdivision levels are achieved with the divide button over in the geometry rollup. Um, you can see that we have a very square object out here. It has 30 points on it. If I divide this once, it goes up to 122 points. It's doing the exact same thing as the smoothing on the dynamic subdivision was doing, but we now have two subdivision levels. If I divide again and again, we have a lot more polygons to sculpt on. We can divide pretty much as often as we like. Um, and when we go back down to the bottom level though, to the very first subdivision level, you can see that I've lost that initial shape. This shape that we had over here, whether I have this turned on or as soon as I turn it off, we revert back to this shape on this object. We've totally lost the square original shape that we had. And that's because it tries to emulate the highest subdivision level at a lower level. So uh, the limits of this are that because we now have real subdivision levels, we can't do stuff like panel loops. We can't slice using the slice curve. And um, it won't allow us to do that. Um, there is one option to do that using the freeze subdivision levels, but that's a more complicated thing. And I don't want to get into that in this tutorial. The default action of this is that it won't allow you to do this. Um, another thing that you can't do is you can't mirror this from one side to the other, um, unless you're using uh, a plugin. The Z plugin Subtool Master Mirror will allow you to do that, but that's more awkward than normal. We can't go into a transform mode and hold down control to try and duplicate that. Um, we can't use panel loops, we can't use slice curves, trim curves, all that kind of stuff becomes much more difficult to do. What we can do though is we can still unwrap this. I can go down to the lowest subdivision level, I'm going down to level one. I can go to our UV master, I can unwrap this. And I can go up to the top subdivision level, and I can sculpt some detail on this, whatever it might be. And then I can go down a couple of levels. So I'm, I've hopped down from level six, where we've had lots of detail, down to level four, where we, we have fewer polygons. Instead of 30,000 at level six, we now have 1,900. And we can go down to our normal map or our displacement map, and we can say create a normal map or displacement map, and that will generate those details for us in the map, as you can see here. So at render time, we will still get the result of the level six, but we'll actually be outputting a level four, uh, a 1,900 polygon object rather than a 30,000 polygon object, but the render will still show the final result as if it were this. And um, so this is great for final objects. All objects generally in, in animation end up this being this object where we have a low resolution cage and high resolution detail and we generate maps to project that detail onto the low resolution cage and animation time, a render time rather. The last object is a Dynamesh object. A Dynamesh object uses the Dynamesh functionality built into ZBrush here. Um, if we don't do anything to the cube, the Dynamesh will try and simulate that cube and it's generated new topology. You can see we've gone up to 98,000. That was based on this resolution. Had I put in a lower resolution, we would have received fewer polygons. And this does not understand dynamic subdivision. So if you did have dynamic subdivision on and you thought that you're going to get a nice smooth object and then you hit Dynamesh and you turn this on and you said, okay, I'm expecting to see that, you're going to get a cube and you're going to wonder why. And that's pretty much because Dynamesh did not understand the dynamic subdivision in the first place. So to avoid that from happening, never use dynamic subdivision if you're intending to dynamesh. You'd always divide this as normal and then use a dynamesh. And that will actually, it, it now off, um, actually asks us about freezing the subdivision levels, which as I said, is another tutorial. We'll say no to that and you'll get the results that you're expecting from a dynamesh. 
So the Dynamesh parameters, the initialized parameters were the exact same as any other Polymesh 3D object. Um, you can use groups, we can slice, we can unwrap, we can do pretty much anything we like with a Dynamesh object. As a matter of fact, more than the normal, because for this object, we can make dramatic changes. And at any given stage, we can just control drag and then change that geometry and get it to reset itself and retopologize itself and generate new geometry, new uh, polygons across the surface evenly. So this is a very flexible way. I wouldn't advise unwrapping this kind of thing because it tends to be a lot heavier. Dynamesh is not really for high res details, but it can be quite heavy. So for when you're first starting off a sculpt, especially organic stuff, Dynamesh is great. When you're first starting off a hard surface sculpt, dynamic subdivision on your hard surface, low resolution polygons is great. And when you get your final model, you're probably going to want to use real subdivision levels. So you're more than likely, as a workflow, start off with a Dynamesh, sculpt, 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 generate a low resolution cage that will fit that, and then from that low resolution cage, generate real subdivision levels and sculpt in the detail. Um, so I think that's everything here. I do have a little screen to try and show you what this is about, um, and hopefully that will help you. And, understanding the difference between primitive objects and polymesh 3d objects please don't forget to subscribe if you find this helpful and i'll try and do more tutorials on this kind of thing later on i know this one was a little long um but yeah there's a lot to go through all right bye